Hello friends, welcome to e Shala. I am Dr. Bharti Garg, Assistant Professor, Department of Public Administration, Punjab University, Chandigarh. Friends, we all know that public policies play a very important role to provide services to the masses. They provide a framework for action to the government so that it can achieve welfare goals and deliver services to the masses. Since independence, our governments have framed various policies to develop the country and to achieve the goals of a welfare state. For example, we have education policies, we have health policy, we have sanitation policy, we have national health missions, etc. to achieve the goals of welfare. But unfortunately, even after so many decades of independence, we have not been able to achieve the goals of welfare and our country still remains an underdeveloped country. If we carry out the policy analysis, we come to the conclusion that these policies have not been framed properly or they lag in one aspect or the other. Here comes in the role of policy analysis, which after analyzing the policies tells us what we need to do, how to frame the policies and thus the study of policy analysis, which studies the policies scientifically and informs us how for policies are to be framed and what can we do to frame good policies so that best efficient and effective results can be achieved it is very important that we study policy analysis so friends in this module we are going to study about the policy analysis its meaning its importance and its scope various methodologies of policy analysis so that you get to understand the meaning of policy analysis and how policy analysis can be applied to make better policies there are different criteria and there were different approaches to define a problem, to generate alternatives for it and to find out which of the alternatives is appropriate as solution for predicting expected outcomes. This unit thus discusses policy analysis in this regard as an important field of policy studies. It starts by defining policy analysis and then goes on to discuss various approaches of policy analysis. Any government has to work under the constraint of limited and finite resources. However, the issues that it faces are numerous. The environment in which government works is characterized by complex social, economic and political realities. It is in this situation that government is expected to come out with policies which address problems and issues arising out of these complex realities. The policy analysts help policy makers in answering the question of what should we do? Policy analysis informs us as to how policies have developed and what is the content and purpose of policy. Policy analysis is also used as a tool to suggest policy makers suitable policy choice for a problem at hand. Thus, the job of a policy analyst can be both descriptive and prescriptive. Policy analysis as a field is very wide involving many approaches and methodologies which many a times are conflicting with each other while claiming superior status. Most studies of policy analysis have clubbed various conflicting approaches into two categories in an effort to answer the question what should we do. Now approaches in policy analysis. Broadly there are two approaches of policy analysis, rationalist policy approach and post positivist approach. We are going to discuss these in detail. Firstly, rationalist approach to policy analysis. Rationalist policy theorists firmly believe that to choose among the various alternatives, one can apply a standard measure to weigh different choices that are available and by this one can come up with a single policy choice. The rationalist policy analysts are mainly in search of objective answers to policy problems through application of methods derived from natural and physical sciences. Togerson describes the evolution of the field of policy analysis historically in three different phases, popularly called phases, in policy analysis depending on differing relationship between knowledge and politics. For him, the first phase symbolizes the rise of rationalist approach which surfaced in the context where knowledge replaced politics. Policy analysis was then conceived as a field of study wherein analysts acting as experts would analyze a problem and find out optimal policy solutions for it. These policy solutions are then conveyed to the decision makers for appropriate action. The decision makers in this sense were clients for the analysts. 
Now the characteristic features of rationalist policy analysis. Rationalist policy analysis is a product of its times when social sciences were dominated by empiricism and neo-positivism, that is, application of methods derived from natural and physical sciences. Rationalist policy analysis has basically three characteristic features. Firstly, it emphasizes on rigorous quantitative analysis to arrive at best alternative. For this purpose, positivist scientific methodologies have been borrowed from various disciplines such as physical sciences, natural sciences, mathematics, economics, statistics, game theories, etc. Of all these disciplines, one can delineate dominant influence of economics on rationalist policy analysis whereby the lessons derived from working of markets are applied in social sector. The alternatives for a problem are ranked by rationalist policy analysts by using various quantitative methodologies, for example, cost-benefit analysis. A numerical measure of the effectiveness of alternatives for achieving designated goals is arrived at by using these methodologies. Once this is done, rationalists believe that best alternative thus identified can be translated into policy. Second characteristic of rationalist policy analysis is its emphasis on separation of facts and values. It firmly believes that policies arising out of value clashes among various actors would be inefficient and is therefore undesirable. Politics should not interfere in policy making exercise. Rationalist policy analysis firmly believes that complex social issues can be solved by collecting relevant objective data and information and then arriving at best alternative by applying scientific research methods. Rationalist policy analysis thus highlights the importance of technocratic form of policy making. The third characteristic of rationalist policy analysis is to generate generalizable findings that would be applicable for various problems in different settings. It is supposed that the social context of an issue would not be a constraint in applicability of the findings in various situations. This belief of rational policy analysts is derived from the field of science where a finding has a general applicability in a wide range of situations. The rationalist emphasizes on the linear causal link between various stages of policy process and relies heavily on quantitative methodologies. Rationalists believe that policy process follows a logical sequence. Payton and Socky have given a model according to which policy analysis is carried out by following six steps. First, problem definition. Second, determination of evaluation criteria. Third, identification of alternatives. Fourth, evaluation of alternatives. Fifth, comparison of alternatives. Sixth is assessment of outcomes. It is believed that if policy analysis follows these basic steps, then we can arrive at optimal solution for any problem. On surface, this may seem to be a simple generic exercise. However, in reality, it involves a much more complex process. The most absorbing aspect of this approach is criteria selection, which is now being discussed below. In a political system, the most important task of government is to allocate limited resources in a way that it maximizes public interest and fulfill numerous demands made from them. In these circumstances, the government must come up with a policy that maximizes social welfare through most efficient distribution of resources possible. Selecting such policy among various others is a challenging task for government. One such framework of policy analysis adopted by rationalist approach to systematically resolve this issue faced by government is the welfare economics paradigm. Hollett and Ramesh opine that welfare economics theory is perhaps the most widely used approach to the study of public policy. Welfare economics is broadly based on the concept that social welfare can be maximized by maximizing aggregate level of individual welfare. Based on this basic principle, welfare economics then provides a design or framework in which this maximization of social welfare is possible. Welfare economics recognizes that due to market failures, markets cannot distribute the resources efficiently as there is lack of regulation. It believes that through effective government intervention, these market failures which reduce social welfare can be controlled and efficient reallocation of resources can be done. Welfare economics theorists forward the criteria of efficiency to measure various alternatives through which government can intervene to maximize social welfare. 
Efficiency criteria can be employed to determine the best way to allocate resources. This criteria of efficiency is guided by the concept of Pareto optimality according to which the best redistribution scenario is one where it could lead to better conditions for one person without affecting or harming the condition of any other person. However, it was later realized that the redistributional nature of most policies leads to a situation wherein benefits provided to a section of society are at the cost of other section of people. For example, subsidies to poor can only be provided by taxing the rich. Therefore, the concept of Pareto efficiency was replaced by Calden criteria according to which a policy is worth implementing if it maximizes social welfare even if people lose, provided it increases the net benefits. In other words, an efficient policy is one in which the sum total of gains is higher than sum total of losses. To achieve this purpose of devising an efficient alternative for a problem, welfare economics uses number of quantitative tools, for example cost-benefit analysis, where a monetary value is assigned to estimated costs and benefits of various alternatives. Then the net benefit of various alternatives is arrived at by subtracting total costs from total benefits. The alternative that has highest net benefit, that is that costs minimum and leads to maximum welfare is then chosen for implementation. Thus, welfare economics paradigm through the application of cost-benefit analysis helps government to allocate resources in an efficient manner. This is done by replicating market decision-making process in social sector. However, welfare economics paradigm has been criticized on many grounds. Firstly, it is not always possible to assign numerical values to consequences as there are many intangible consequences of a policy which cannot be quantitatively measured. For example, clean air, human life and freedom from sickness or disease, for example, have all been monetized by cost-benefit analysis studies, but such valuations are frequently challenged as inaccurate, misleading or meaningless. Secondly, a policy may have different consequences for different set of people. These consequences cannot always be aggregated and the need is to evaluate them separately. Thirdly, the criteria of efficiency which forms the backbone of welfare economic paradigm has been countered by many. Stone equates measuring of efficiency as pulling oneself out of quicksand without a rope. Policy making cannot completely be a technocratic exercise and is essentially a political exercise. In this context, efficiency is then just another value which is used by the policy makers to justify a particular policy choice so that their interests can be served. Irrespective of these criticisms, cost-benefit analysis has been widely used as a technique for policy analysis in many countries. The defendants of this technique argue that cost-benefit analysis has the potential to guard against unproductive and ineffective policies which are produced as a result of political pressures in representative democracies. Now in assessment of rationalist approach to policy analysis. The aim of rational policy analysis was to create rational model of decision making using methodologies derived from neo-positivist and empirical theories. Rationality approach is still dominant tradition in policy analysis and one can observe its inimitable influence in contemporary policy analysis exercises. Over the years, rationalist policy analysis has to its claim a fair share of successes. Its widespread and unmatched presence in policy process cannot be denied. It is deeply embedded into governance, structure and practices. Apart from independent analysts and think tanks, governments have their own agencies where information is produced and transferred to decision makers so that efficient policies can be formulated. The job of government staff in these departments is to produce relevant data and information through rigorous quantitative analysis and supply it to the policy makers for appropriate policy action. Outside the ambit of formal government structures, various non-profit organizations and consulting firms have also surfaced in large numbers which follow rationalist approach to generate relevant information for policy makers. Rationalist policy analysis has also indelible imprint on policy studies in academics. Various policy studies organizations and research institutions, both private and government funded, have cropped up since 1960s that are solely devoted to the purposes of rationalist policy analysis.
based on methodologies and conceptual frameworks borrowed from other disciplines rationalist policy analysis have over the years created a huge repository of data and information that have been used by policy makers in various countries to come up with policy solutions for maximizing public welfare Various empirical methodologies such as modeling, quantification of inputs and outputs, descriptive statistics, statistical inference, operations research, cost benefit analysis and risk benefit analysis have been devised under the aegis of rationalist approach to assist policy makers in decision making by systematically analyzing problem through empirical methods and finding solutions having an objective foundation to attain predecided goals. These quantitative methods are being used extensively by the government governments around the world for policy formation The above discussion shows that rationalist approach to policy analysis has enjoyed considerable success However this approach has faced challenges from many quarters which can be discussed under two broad categories Firstly the rationalist approach to policy analysis has been criticized that its various conceptual underpinnings beliefs and assumptions which are its foundation have been said to be standing on a shaky ground The most foundational assumption of rationalist model is that individuals are self-interested beings and try to maximize utility for themselves. Critics view that to say that individuals are only motivated by self-interest is a reductionist claim motivated by economic theories which does not capture the whole reality. Many actions of individuals are also inspired by the intrinsic reward associated with them. Moreover, individual actions are also shaped by the various groups to which they belong. The homogeneity of individual preference shaping as sought by rationalist approach leads them to claim that since this aspect of human behavior is universally true decision making can be studied scientifically hence the rationalists advocate for objective separation of facts and values in policy analysis and assert that their findings could be generalized irrespective of the social context However, critics maintain that no policy analysis can be completely value neutral. Policy making is essentially a political exercise and cannot be reduced to a merely technocratic process. Critics argue that rationalists in their zeal to give primacy to knowledge over politics do not take into account the uncertainty and complexity associated with policy making exercise. Policy making is ultimately a matter of political choice. Political considerations are active right from the stage of problem definition till goal setting. In such circumstances, many a times policy analysis becomes a tool in the hands of policy makers and further political ammunition for actors in policy process. The policy choices made by decision makers are not always intended to maximize social welfare but if suitable it also advocates the political agenda of those in power in these circumstances the value neutrality claim of rationalists seem to be hollow The second set of criticisms is targeted towards the methodologies used by rationalist approach to policy analysis. Most of the criticisms in this regard emanate from the market model of decision making advanced by the rationalists which uses efficiency as its primary criteria to judge alternate policies. Apart from these criticisms and assessment of initial applications of rationalist policy analysis by many scholars revealed that it could not achieve what it promised in terms of optimal results. Frank Fisher discusses two such cases in detail where the application of rationalist policy analysis for technocratic policy making could not lead to promised results. The first among them is the failure of anti-poverty programs in USA and secondly the limits of technical analysis of policies became widely evident during USA's failure in Vietnam War. Apart from these failings in application rationalist approach also got a setback from the studies emerging in 1970s and 1980s. which observed that empiricist policy analysis was not used much by the policy makers in framing of policies now we are going to discuss about post positivist approach to policy analysis all these developments mentioned above forced the policy analysts to reassess the overbearing empiricist influence on policy analysis that led to the emergence of post positivist approach to policy analysis apart from the methodological failings of rationalist approach many changes in the field of politics also provided momentum for the emergence of this new wave of policy analysis studies 
Now there is an institutional void and dawn of post positivism which is the second phase as per Togerson. So we are going to discuss that. For Togerson, the first phase signified the phase when technocratic orientation to policy analysis was dominant. According to him, the second phase is a phase when critical assessment of conventional policy analysis began. Togerson points out that during this time various scholars started questioning the postulates of rational policy analysis and claimed that it failed in grasping and incorporating political realities and the context of policy process. Martin Hager has identified various factors that have led to change in the context of policy making and politics posing challenges to the classical modernist institutions. The basic question that he attempts to answer is how should policy analysis respond to the changing context of policy making? For Hager, classical modernist institutions meant the traditional official setting of policy making and politics wherein policy was made with expert knowledge and people at the helm of the state affairs implemented those policies. He opines that as opposed to classical modernist institutions, new political spaces have come up where policies are negotiated and formulated. These new spaces are characterized by institutional void wherein there are no clear rules and norms according to which politics is to be conducted and policy measures are to be agreed upon. The factors leading to such institutional void signifying the changing context of policy making and politics emanate from diminishing role of state and changing role of knowledge in policy process. For Hedger, the authority of the classical modernist institutions in policy process stand challenged due to five developments in contemporary times. Firstly, the new order of decision making is dispersed due to emergence of international civil society activities of transnational and domestic pressure groups, NGOs and other non-state actors, social movements and the new strategies adopted by them and the participant role of media. Secondly, there is a new speciality of policy making and politics. Hager cites an example of European Union where contrary to belief that it served mainly the corporate interests allowed the entry of civil society through one of its clauses. The concept of multi-level governance gets more complex in this way and the structured format of decision making is no more relevant. Thirdly, the ways in which we traditionally involved people in policy deliberation to achieve the ideals of democratic governance has become a problem in itself and therefore we need to rethink over it. Fourthly, authority of classical or scientific expertise has been undermined. The data produced by it creates more uncertainty and therefore the findings of technocratic experts no longer enjoy trust that it used to earlier. The scientific advice is vulnerable to become the intellectual handmaiden of government agencies. Last but not the least, the context of policy making is getting expansive. New issues emerging from fields such as genetics and biotechnology challenge the conventional logic of sovereignty of states to decide on these matters independently. Issues of patent and copyright raise complex questions regarding the market mode of governance applied to them. It also raises questions as to which actors, that is WTO governments, people or corporate sector have the legitimate right to decide on such matters. In light of these challenges, it is recommended to develop new methods of policy analysis in contrast to rationalist policy analysis which criticized its over-reliance on empiricist methods and advocated for broader deliberation among various stakeholders. Now, the post-positivist analysis and its methods. Post-positivists accuse rationalist policy analysts to be anti-democratic and having elite bias as it pays heed only to expert advices by overlooking the preferences of citizens. In this process, it basically seeks to divorce policy analysis from politics. By claiming superiority of reason, the rationalist policy analysts in practice serve the interests and preferences of their own and of the ruling regime to which they extend their technocratic expertise. In response to this post-positivist by rejecting positivist orientation contend that there is a need to engage various stakeholders in policy process which is essentially complex, diverse and value laden. In other words, post-positivists advocate for more open and informed dialogue between various stakeholders in a policy process to arrive at consensus among them resulting in a broader and appropriate policy solution. This methodology of post-positivist analysis is called deliberative analysis. 
The post positivists challenge the rationalist assumption that facts have an independent existence and they are given. We just need to discover them. The post positivists believe that the perceptions and preferences of individuals are socially constructed. Our understanding of the world around us is shaped by our everyday experiences, interpretation of those experiences, our thoughts, interaction with their social surrounding, our recollections and expectations. As a result, the field of public policy is also developed through socially interpreted understanding. The discourses dominant in policy making may not be constructed by the actors but circulated from elsewhere. It is then imperative for the analyst to interpret these discourses which influence the understanding of actors. The differences in the discourses present in a policy arena lead to actors advancing different policy alternatives. In this situation, post-positivists believe that the job of policy analyst is to delineate these different discourses and understand how they shape the preferences of the policy actors. By understanding the various discursive constructs, a policy analyst can help decision makers and citizens develop alternatives that speak to their own needs and interests rather than those defined and shaped for them by others. This information provided by analysts makes the policy actors more aware about their social context and their real needs and it would eventually help them in expressing their original expectations. In this situation, the job of policy analyst is to understand the various conflicting and differing perspectives, their origins and their meanings and to reach consensus for a coherent policy choice. In this process, the analyst is no more in a consultative role but is in a participative role. This process helps in augmenting the understanding of analysts regarding the context of policy analysis which was earlier ignored in rationalist approach. Post-positivists believe that meaningful deliberative interactions among the stakeholders can lead to better policies that reflect the real needs of citizens and it would eventually serve the true ideals of participatory democracy. The wide base of deliberations would also provide much needed legitimacy to public policies. To fulfill these needs, various techniques of deliberative policy analysis were developed. Two such important techniques are participatory policy analysis and deliberative polling that have been widely studied and it is believed that their application have received fair share of success in policy making. The other methodologies of post-positive analysis that are widely used are policy discourse analysis, argumentative analysis and interpretative and narrative policy analysis. Now the criticisms of post-positivist approach. The post-positivist approach like its counterpart rationalist approach has been a target of criticism by many. Some of the criticisms come from rationalist approach as it tries to defend its position. The other set of criticisms are related to its epistemological foundation and its methods. Smith and Larimer has enumerated the rationalist response to the post-positivist criticism against them. Firstly, the rationalists argue that the post-positivists have forwarded a wrong understanding of their approach and methods and in the zeal to criticize them have not been able to present any systematic model as an alternative to policy analysis. Secondly, rationalists argue that they never denied that they are value-based as contended by post-positivists in a way of criticism. They contend that treating efficiency as a value for analysis does not mean that there are no other values for decision-making like justice and democracy. They only treat efficiency as the most important value for decision-making as its measure gives us a reliable basis for judging worth of various policy alternatives. Thirdly, rationalists also challenge the criticism directed at them by the post-positivists that it is oblivious to political realities and conflicts emerging from distributional policies. Rationalists contend that by cost-benefit analysis, they are able to judge the winners and losers in any policy. It can also find out the magnitude of difference between them. By doing this, rationalists actually provide proper information which then can be used to mitigate the ill effects of a policy so that wide differences in distributional gains do not lead to conflict situation. The second set of criticisms directed against post-positivists is related to its methodological assumptions and theoretical underpinnings. It is contended that if we agree to the contention of post-positivists that all reality is socially constructed, then the dilemma before us is that we can never be sure as to whose version of reality is accurate. 
it also leads us to a problematic question as to how to adjudicate between rival interpretations and competing claims. The claim of post-positivists that unhindered and open deliberation among various stakeholders could lead to better policy solutions has also been challenged by many scholars. It has been argued that there is no surety that the deliberative process would not be dominated by ill-intentioned organized groups who on account of their unmatched resources could sway the results in such deliberations. To conclude the discussion in this module, I would like to say that public policy analysis is very important to know what we can do to deal with the problems of policy implementation, policy making and policy evaluation. If the policies are properly made, only then they can be implemented properly and policy analysis thus can help us in making and framing right kind of policies so that the development processes are not delayed further. Friends, we also discussed about two broad, broad approaches which we discussed in this module about the policy analysis. First is the rationalist approach and second is the post-positivist approach. The rationalist approach makes use of various econometric statistical tools to scientifically frame policies. Whereas the post-positive approach, it recognizes the fact that there are large number of stakeholders involved in policy making and it analyzes the role of political class, the role of value systems in political in policy making. Thus friends, it is very important that we must consider these two approaches in policy making. We cannot reject either of the approaches to weigh the other approach. So friends, it is very important that while framing policies and carrying out the policy analysis, we take into account these two broad approaches of policy analysis so that statistical tools can also be applied and policy maker also considers the role of values, various actors in policy making, the political class, the interests of the stakeholders. So all these factors must be factored in while making a policy. Thank you.